But when you say that you know spirituality or the need for it is part of the human condition, I, I, I'm, I'm with you there, and I'm also with you in wanting to treat this as something that is volatile. Today is Friday, May 28th. The year is 2021. This is No Easy Answers, and I'm your host, Jules Taylor. Today, like all days, I have no easy answers for you. Well, thank you for tuning in from wherever you happen to be listening. My name is Jules Taylor, this is No Easy Answers, and I am delighted to have you with us for today's episode. No Easy Answers is a podcast about politics, philosophy, and the human condition, and we are 100% listener-supported, meaning we entrust our listenership to keep this show going. So if you like what we do and you want to see us grow, the best single way, you know, the single best way you can help us is by becoming a paid monthly subscriber on our Patreon. One of these days, we might have some bonus content for y'all, but today is not that day because so far, nothing we do is behind a paywall, and I would like to keep all of these episodes and conversations available to everyone. So subscribing to our Patreon helps keep all the writing, researching, reading, and interviewing going. So if you dig it, the best way you can help us is by becoming a paid monthly subscriber. Short of a monetary donation, you can always leave us a positive review in Apple Podcasts or Audible. You can share these episodes with your friends and family. You can follow us on Twitter and like our Facebook page. You can always join the conversation by commenting on our Reddit page or reaching out to us over Discord. Also, we always welcome your comments, concerns, criticisms, and vitriol. Send those to noeasyanswerspodcast at gmail. And as always, we want to say thank you to all of our listeners and to all of our Patreon subscribers. We quite literally could not do this without you. So today on the show, I have Professor Benjamin Teitelbaum joining us for an interview about his book called War for Eternity, The Return of Traditionalism and the Rise of the Populist Right. He spent many hours interviewing the enigmatic characters of Steve Bannon, Alexander Dugan, and Olavo del Carvajo, and he also, you know, he can offer us a tremendous amount of unique insight into the far right. And on a personal note, I want to say that the previous episode and our deep dives on people like Heidegger and Schmidt that are in forthcoming episodes, all of that is a result of me picking up a copy of his book. And honestly, that book was so difficult to sit down once I started reading it because, you know, the way the book is written, it's a first person account of interviews he's conducted, but it's also a crash course in traditionalist thought. And over the course of the book, Professor Teitelbaum helps present to us an emerging image of the world of geopolitics intersecting with traditionalism. So as you progress further into the book, you can really pick up on the urgency and the danger of the things he's presenting. And so in conducting my own research for this podcast, I have to say that War for Eternity really set me into a lot of research and writing that I did not expect. So a lot of the stuff from episode 29 came as a result of me reading this book, and the arch this show is taking over the next couple of episodes, that's all coming out of the things I read and learned about from reading his book. I have to say that I really enjoyed talking to Professor Teitelbaum, and I'm hoping to have him on again in future shows to further our discussions, because there's a million branches we could split off to and discuss, and if you read his book War for Eternity, I'm sure you'll feel as I do that we are not finished contending with the influence of traditionalism in contemporary geopolitics. So. I'll have links to the book, the Wikipedia page for some of those characters we're speaking about, and other things in the show notes. So let's get to our interview with Dr. Benjamin Teitelbaum. So yeah, brother, I have been very, uh, very interested and curious to talk to you because I, I read your book and, it, you know, at some point in reading your book, the sort of 
the urgency and the danger of the moment and the happenings that you were describing became more salient as I put the book down and started Googling the things you were talking about and the people you were meeting with. And so, yeah. so this really like, it's, it spun me out into a few months of just doing research on all sorts of things. And, um, and I, I find that there, you know, there's not a whole lot of people aware of this stuff, but if they are, it's just very like a cursory understanding. There's not an in-depth dive into like traditionalism and the implications of things and uh and how this is working on the geopolitical level so just you know kudos to you and your book brother like i just it, it really uh it, it's changed some of the ways that i think about the far right it, it's given me a tremendous amount of insight into the like psychological and cognitive workings of the alt-right and um <laughs> So, so yeah, so I'm really excited about our conversation. Um, but I know, I know you're a musician, so I wanted to ask you a couple like music questions first, man. Like, uh, does he say you're, you're a music ethnographer and there's like a million things I could ask you about that, but I wonder if you might like start of, maybe we can start by, you can, you can tell us what that entails. Uh, and maybe along the way you can tell us how you came to play the nickel harp. <laughs> sure, sure. And I see that, I see that you're a musician too, Jules. I can see in the background, the guitars yeah. and everything. <laughs> Um, I mean, ethnomusicology is the study of music and culture. Some people say it's the study of music as culture. You know, you can you can go in circles about the definition, but you kind of look at, you know, studying musical sound itself, studying why and how we use musical sound. Uh, all, all of those things are kind of subjects for, for ethnomusicology. And... I went into it actually thinking I was going to do something much, much different. I I started playing Swedish folk music when I was in high school and in middle school, so a long time ago. And I was going to, I really wanted to study the intricacies of rhythmic patterns in Western Swedish folk music. Right. So a really narrow subject, it still fascinates me. I've, I've basically put that on hold. I don't know how many people in the world would be interested in reading about that but it, it i cared a lot about it right right <laughs> but i i also as i was in grad school and very interested and passionate about politics and i was over in sweden getting ready to do research on my on my kind of nerdy little topic and that's when the far right really started advancing in sweden mm. and one of it was a shock because one of the areas of interest for them it wasn't just immigration it wasn't just gender politics those kind of standard far right things but they they wanted to see a new cultural policy take shape in sweden they were for some of some of their leading politicians were as interested in cultural politics as they were immigration and everything right. else and and music was a part of that and so i said okay well why don't i why don't i kind of follow what's going on in this in this scene and it opened up into a, a really fascinating story that had not just to do with political parties but also kind of revolutionary militant groups intellectual outlets who were all all trying to rebrand themselves and also trying to reimagine who they were in the world and what their what their visions should be in the future. And and I really think, you know, music, cultural expressions, things like that, they told a more complete and more vivid story than just reading, you know, policy statements and and speeches. So that was that was my introduction. I still you know, today I'm interested in politics, I'm interested in music, I'm interested where they cross, and I'm happy also to study them separately. I, right. I don't believe that much in the in the titles that we use in, in the university. Gotcha. You know, to designate who we are, I, I, I'm not a slave to them, but sure. um, but I still definitely believe that if if you if you're interested in politics, if you're interested in geopolitics, social changes, you have to pay attention to other areas of social behavior than what we typically think of as politics. Right, right. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you on that sense. And um, I want to say that, like, when I came to your work, it was kind of after the January 6th events that happened. But you really helped me clarify some questions that I had, because you mentioned that the politicians you're referring to were interested in cultural projects, right? And, yes. and to me, when I saw... Uh, January 6th and the people who ran or who rioted at the Capitol or what have you, I didn't seem to, to find a political project amongst them. Like it was 
cultural or it was spiritual. Um, and I, you know, I had this thought that I was like, you know, these people aren't social Democrats in waiting. Like if we had passed all sorts of legislation that would objectively made their lives better, if we gave them Medicare for all, if we gave them uh, for student loan forgiveness, I don't think that they would be responsive to those things because clearly they're socially and political or socially and, uh, and, and, and culturally, you know, spiritually inclined, but not necessarily political. So unwrapping yes. that, unwrapping yeah. that and figuring out like how something cultural or spiritual could take on overt political implications or, 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 or causal things. Uh, I think your book really helped clarify how that was possible for me. That uh, among potential compliments I could receive that, that one would be maybe my favorite Jules because. Oh, wow. Yeah. It, it, yeah, it, it's really, you really start to think when I listen to some commentators, especially from the center left, occasionally in the center right, they really sound tone deaf right. when, when they start to say, well, you know, if, if these rogue idiots, if we just gave them a little more money. Right, right. Right. If we rearrange society in such a way that they had a little bit more money, this would all be cool. Um, you know, there's some kind of classic Marxist ways of thinking underneath that but there's it also misses so much about about what people are saying they want and need and also the fact that you know some politics is really actually a, a sort of aesthetic ritual right right for for people I'm, I'm not to say that i'm calling the writers on january 6th fascists per se but one one thing that walter benjamin said mm -hmm. a famous theorist was that fascism is first and foremost an aesthetic cause and that even even its war even its war making is actually about aesthetics there's an aesthetic value for war that's playing itself out here it don't don't if you're in the weeds about policy that's that's only going to tell you a small part of the picture and prob probably not the essential part of the picture right right yeah. And, you know, the other thing is that uh, your work in Sweden, uh, to me, it seems like what sort of encapsulates the fact that these are cultural, social, spiritual and non-political projects is that like even in a place like Sweden where they have like a, a form of democratic socialism, which is like capitalism reined in to where you have maybe a UBI or uh, mm -hmm. a, a livable wage. I mean, with all these legislations or things in place, the far right is resurgent, maybe the most up there. So. Well, and, and ironically, I mean, that really scrambles our, our understandings of left and right, because yeah. the way that they are framing themselves is that they are actually the stewards and champions of the welfare state, just the proper version of it, right? For right, the right, right. people, and, and sure. it, it involves some nostalgia for for the early days of, of, of welfare socialism in Sweden. Um, you know, so so that that is, is going to voters. Um, the Social Democrats have kind of famously said, "We, you know, we hate the far right. We, you know, have nothing to do with them. We are their foremost opponents." But a lot of their voters are the voters who are moving over and filling the ranks of the new far right party. Mm. And we've seen this elsewhere. It played out in in a in a strange way, in a, in a slightly more opaque way, in the twenty sixteen election where you looked at the electoral map in the united states and you look at which states flipped right right it was it it was the old left that you know didn't show up slash switched allegiances a little bit so we're talking pennsylvania ohio michigan wisconsin right. first and foremost and you know so something is going on there too where the transformation that the left has has gone through these past decades from being primarily a labor focused um, in past decades, past past century, essentially half century, um, primarily being a labor focused uh, critique of capitalist society to becoming more interested in, in identity politics, trying to conceptualize oppression, um, injustice more more holistically. That 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 move has left a large portion of its of its voting block alienated sure from, and they're eventually saying okay well where can i find a critique of capitalism that does not have 
this other these other cultural associations in some senses that I don't want. And the center right is, of course, not going to do that because the center right is, you know, is this this beacon of of free market principles in, in many cases um, throughout, you know, Western Europe and North America. Yeah. But the far right combines, you know, the economic politics of, of at least at least at face value part of the old left with without um, the the more encompassing critique of injustice and and identity politics, right? Yeah, you know it's um it's really wild to me to see how, I mean, not to jump too far ahead, but like is someone like Alexander Dugin who's kind of synergizing ideas from both the left and the right, um, and and so you see him borrowing these ideas and putting them together with like the national Bolshevik thing or the Eurasian nationalism. Mm-hmm. And and I, I kind of identify that as a very dangerous sort of political thinker in that, like, um, is I, I, in talking to some folks on the left, they've told me that, you know, they used to call some folks comrades who were on the left, who eventually kind of made their way over to sort of Dugan's way of thinking. Um, and it's really dangerous as he's kind of appropriating that, the, the, you know, like you said, the, they are the true stewards of the social welfare state. They're trying to rebrand themselves as that. So it's um it's really alarming and it's uh and you know and it was through your book that I kind of understood how these alternative critiques of capitalism I mean we're not even talking about just like Schmidtian stuff we're talking about straight up like critiques of of modernity and a wish to return to a pre enlightenment uh, pre Christian way of being uh, that yeah it's also it's also unsettling man like I. I, I went through, I, you know, some of these Google searches went to some very, very dark places uh, in, yeah. in reading your book, brother. Um, yeah. So, so I, I, I guess, and because I've, because I've listened to so many of your interviews now, and because I've read your book, and I, um, I, I want to start our conversation by asking you to sort of just give us your, um, because rather than going through and asking you about what traditionalism is and all the details of that stuff, which I'm sure that you're probably tired of explaining <laughs> as well with all of your interviews, but but maybe you could kind of group all of this into one sort of like set the table for your book, um, why people should read it, what the elements are, if it's possible to do that kind of all at once. Uh, I wonder if that's, if you could do that for us. I mean, here's, here's a way to, to work into that. So, one critique that I receive, and I think a lot of scholars of the right receive, is why don't you call the people you're studying fascists? I already kind of dropped that just in our preamble sure, sure. a moment ago. And, and the general assumption is, is that if you don't call these people fascists, you are paying them some sort of compliment. You are normalizing them. You are beautifying them, euphemizing sure. their cause. And when you look at the ideas that I've studied actually more, more carefully, all of a sudden you find yourself unable to go along with the idea that most, most political discourse in the West wants us to go along with, which is that fascism is the utmost extreme of political ideologies. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're the worst of the worst, you're a fascist because there's nothing beyond that. What, what I'm studying this capital T traditionalism might in some senses be conceived of as being beyond fascism, of actually right. illuminating what it looks like and what something would be like if it's outside, if it's actually a more radical divergence from the status quo and the mainstream in the West um, than fascism is. And it ends up, and that's certainly the, the, the account that some of, its, some of its ambassadors arrived at, but what it, what it eventually arrives at is saying, yeah, you might think fascism is, is the opposite of you, but fascism shares your trust in progress. It shares your belief in mass rationalization. It probably shares your belief in secularization. It um, and and uh, and also might even share your belief in organization and even homo- homogenization, at least within within the the sphere of a nation state. Um, and and we can imagine actually political ideologies that don't include any of those things um, that yes reject multi-ethnic democracy reject feminism you know but also reject progress reject mass rationalization of society reject secularism uh, push back against the whole project one thing that Alexander Dugan one of the figures I study in the book I, I think is entirely right about is and it's 
not specific to him, but his characterization of history when he says, okay, you had liberalism and you had fascism in the, in the early 20th century, and all of them were competing for the same thing, actually. They were all competing for the ability to modernize, to be right. the foremost avatar of modernity in, in global political life. Liberalism won, but fascism was contending for that same, that same position. The ideology, traditionalism that they are espousing rejects even that. And I think it, at, at face value, that's a correct, uh, a, a correct assessment. We are talking about um, figures who, who believe, do not believe that we can create a meaningfully different and better society for ourselves. That believe instead um, that the best that we could ever hope to be, we have already been. And by the way, that we can return to that in some meaningful sense. They do not look to a society where everyone is equalized, where the concept, let's say, of citizenship is, is the foremost identity and we all can be different in our different ways, but our most important identity is that we are all citizens, we are equal before the law, and we can all be thought of as having the same destiny and the same, same social function. They demand a stratified society. They want to see it inherited in archaic identities, if it is our gender, if it's our race, our ethnicity, our religion. They want to see those made meaningful again and to let them fracture society, not unite society, but fracture it. Mm. Um, just those sets of principles were there are enough to, to let us know that we're dealing with a set of ideas uh, very foreign to most people. I don't think my dear colleagues in political science, uh, whether at my university or elsewhere, are, are that familiar in encountering this type of, of deep anti-modernism. Right. I mean, briefly, Jules, I mean, it's, it's sure. important to note that all of that can see, it, you can sometimes reach a point in which you're so radical or you're so your divergence from the mainstream is so dramatic that it's no, it's no longer serious, but this it actually lives as a sort of theater, right? A, a sort of dress up play or LARPing or whatever the new, the new word is. And that, mm -hmm. that's a legitimate critique against all this, but at least theoretically on paper, it tries to be something more dramatic more divergent and more radical than Nazism, fascism, white nationalism, the whole, the whole bunch of it. Yeah, I mean, it was difficult for me to, uh, to really reckon with and, and, and understand that this marginalized of the marginalized sort of spiritual uh, theologies or what have, or whatever we want, to, we want to call traditionalism was actually like in the halls of power. So like connecting this sort of you know, like you said, this sort of LARPing thing. I mean, you, you go back and you read some of like Evola's stuff and I'm like, what is this gnosis you're doing? What is this? What are you doing in your bedroom, man? That like there's this practice of like, I don't know, becoming more in tune with the absolute, as he says, you know, so it's it's a little uh, it's it's you, it's very easy to ridicule that on its face, but when you step back and you're like, wait a second, these people are being quoted by people in positions of power. Some of them sort of uh, take more influence from Avila than others. Um, but it, it was, it was, I guess, so maybe you could answer the, can you speak to the way that like Julius Avila's work take these notions of alternative spirituality and, and sort of align them with right-wing politics? Because I'm curious to hear how you might describe the way Evolian thought adds to the adds the realm of the political to otherwise a sort of non-political belief system. Yes. Great questions. Jules. Awesome. I mean, the we already know because traditionalism rejects progressivism, and they all do, even previous right. previous to these these explicitly right-wing thinkers like Julius Evola, it's not going to be an accessory to modern liberalism right. or progressive or the progressive left. Um, I, you know, I occasionally get in discussions with people about whether, well, you know, is traditionalism inherently political is it inherently rightist. It's at least inherently not leftist because of that. <laughs> right. It's, it's right, right. reactionary. It's anti-progressive. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it might even embrace the term regressive. But when I, when I say earlier that traditionalists don't believe that we're going to make a meaningfully better society than has ever been. And when I say that they think society has been at its best in the past and that we can return to that all, 
all the details of that are left open, right? And you mm-hmm. see certain thinkers come in and start to say, okay, well, what is it that's bad about the present? What is it that's great about the past? And there's where you have seen thinkers like Julius Avila, this, um, what should we call him, a fascist sympathizer of, um, uh, if nothing else, uh, during during Mussolini's time. He comes in and and he says, okay, partially, you know what's great about the past? You know what degraded as time has moved forward and as everyone else thought, things that were getting better? What's great about the past was uh, the supremacy of masculinity, uh, was was the hierarchical exaltation of Aryans atop Mm non-Aryans. And the interweaving of those identities with spirituality, such that we you really can't talk about a genuine masculinity without talking about a genuine Aryan racial identity. You can't talk about that without talking about a spiritual dimension. Mm. Um, that being being an Aryan involves being priestly in your disposition toward the world. Um, and you can't have those principles reigning in a society at all. Without hierarchy and without borders, without structure. Um, we're not going to have a mass globalized society where everyone is mixing together, um, moving around as they please, and that is also spiritual. It is, it, it, there's a necessary association in Julius Evola's thinking between materialism, non Aryan racial identity, and mm. you know, mixing of that, and borderlessness. Hmm. Uh, borderless was yes in terms of let's say national borders but really for Evola the interest was almost in, internal to the political a- entity that you know you want to see inside of societies that there's not homogenization going on but the different people are preserve preserving their difference different groups are separate from each other um that's those are the principles that were golden in his mind those are the things that we are going to return to and he doesn't he doesn't think it's an accident that as we're ostensibly in the dark age, living in modernity, we see borderlessness, materialism, we see politics that only is about economics, right? The right wants more personal freedom, the left wants more social justice and collectivism and economics, but that's uh, that's where our debate lies. It's materialistic. Um, and we see the breakdown of hierarchies, we see um, gender identity being being uh, de-emphasized in its social significance uh all of all of those things so that's 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 how he's looking and that's that's where you get to a particular type of political rightism not a neoliberal not a free market rightism because in their mind that is absolutely leftism that's just another brand of leftism but right it's just anti-progressive uh anti-homogenizing anti-rationalizing anti-massifying uh, right wing vision. You know, um, and that's, that's all excellent, man. Like it's, um, I, yeah. So I, I wonder if you picked up on this, man, when I was really getting a feel for, uh, Evola's thought, um, I, I started to get kind of an Aristotelian vibe coming from him that he would, uh, similar to Aristotle, look at like, uh, I don't know, like not that, not to say that Aristotle was a racist or anything like that, but that he said that like some people are meant to rule and some people are meant for slavery or something. And so uh, there is a thought that perhaps um, if slavery is, is like a natural fact of nature to Aristotle, then society could only be sort of ordered with these concepts in mind. And so the sort of natural sort of hierarchy thing that Evola is like a naturally stratified society with priests at the top uh, i saw some some sort of analogous sort of uh, like a mirroring of sort of aristotelian thought uh to that end and i wonder if you picked up on that through evola yeah in in that respect i you know the reason i think like a, a variant of ideas would push back so you know there's so many other ways yeah as well but yes in this kind of mechanistic functionalist understanding anthropology let's say sure of, of society that you know that we all are going to have our place and and we are destined for for different things and you know life life will be better if we are in our proper place um in that respect there's 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 some overlap yes yeah um so 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 i i in researching Rene Guénon and Evola and understanding that they 
kind of knew each other and in their day they they wrote uh, certain works together at times um i wonder like I, there are other key thinkers in traditionalism and i wonder if they're as problematic like are we going to hear some neo-nazi quoting anand kumaswamy or or Fritzschaff <laughs> swan or something i mean are these are the only problematic traditionalists or would you say that there are others that, that well sean no doubt okay um, you know it is is scandalized um you know not not just because of what actually is taking place in his sufi tariqa um in indiana but also also because of his his writings okay he and we haven't really gone into the weeds of what traditionalism is there there are different ways of thinking about it intellectually there one of its accounts it, on, on one hand, its account of history is is universalizing and, and unifying, actually. You know, it says that all of humanity, we are actually all heirs to the same historical truth, the tradition, capital T. Right. Um, and but in the, in the same breath, they say, OK, that's true, except but that one truth, it's, its teachings have been splintered in all of these different channels. And really, the only way we can access the, that truth is by sticking to one channel. Right. Um, you know, and for them, that that usually means pick a religious tradition, the esoteric brand or mystical brand of a religious tradition, devote your life to it, and maybe you'll get some scraps of of that of that true essence. Um, so that's how they see things. Built into that, you could either say, "Okay, wow, we're all one, right? Unified," or you can say, "Yeah, we're all one, but really, to the extent that it matters." We're, we're actually separate and you need to stay separate you need to pick, stick to your path and um evola of course is pretty strong when that you know emphasizing the difference the anthropological difference in right. traditionalism sean <laughs> migrated throughout his 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 life and ends up kind of saying kind of being the universalistic person although he saw himself as being the agent of that universalism he, he was the one who oh. could bring it all together wow so, so, so that he he attracted though some followers who who were certainly right wing reactionary extremists or xenophobic or anything like that. But his teachings were also explicitly in some of his writings it really targeted feminism, targeted emancipatory feminism. Wow! Uh, even targeted race mixing. And uh, there's another, I haven't done that, that work myself. There's another scholar who, who has uh, studied and, and sees some signs of kind of anti-Semitism in Sean's, Sean's oh, wow. thinking. But, but certainly uh, racial separatism, uh, stratified gender differences, that's, that's something that, that even Sean worked for. But if you look at the broader, the big picture traditionalism, I don't think that there's room for a lot of progressivism there, but that doesn't mean that they all are uh are right-wing extremists by any means this is this is a diffuse movement that attracts lots and lots of different different people to it and uh, you know so but your original question was who you know are our contemporary right-wing extremists discreetly conceived who are they citing in in traditionalism and most often it's julius evola Right. Uh, right. Rene Guénon gets gets cited a fair amount for a long time. The website Countercurrents, which is a, which is a major white nationalist hub, was was essentially laying out not Hitler, not even Savitri Devi, not even William Pierce, but Rene Guénon as as having articulated their mission. Right. Um, but, you know, and it had to do with his understanding of decline and um, the modern world being being a, uh, itself a late stage of decline in a time cycle. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned Debbie, man. And uh, what a trip that uh, researching her was. Um, but I, you know, I found myself asking in reading uh, Nicholas Goodrich Clark's book about uh, Savitri Devi. Um, I found myself asking and not able to find any information on this, but are you aware of any uh, engagement with the writings of Gwenon or Evola by Savitri Devi? Because I, I think by the time she had moved to India, it, uh, I think Evola already had like 11 books published or something like that. So it's, yeah. it's hard for me to imagine that there wasn't some cross-pollination happening there. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, and I, I cite that in my book. It's a little hard. Oh, you know, it's not okay. written with, with actually numbered footnotes. So yeah. you're totally excused. <laughs> 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 but 
Um, but I do cite, she, and I'm forgetting the actual source, uh, but she sure. mentioned both Gunon and Avila. Oh, Jesus. Um, All right. Wow. And, and if it's a letter or a book or some, something of that nature. Um, and I, I wonder before that, I mean, the, the ideas, the association between, let's say, Hinduism and this kind of Teutonic, Germanic Arianism mm -hmm. exists before Gunon, of course. Um, and Gunon is is repackaging from Hinduism um, when he first and foremost when he starts talking about time cycles and hierarchies and stuff like that. So so it's not it's not as though he's going to be the only source for that. And Evola is not going to be the only one to start associating Hindu notions and references to Arianism with the you know more expressly racialized Germanic notions of Arianism. It's very complicated. That whole history is is a mess. There's an amazing book called Arian Idols, um, written mm. by a professor from Sweden that that lays that out if anyone's interested. Cool. But um so, so all that is to say, I mean, I think that Savitri Devi, I, I don't know the particulars of her early life, but it, it's not at all impossible that she starts working in the same channels as Evelyn at the same time, and then they and then they meet at a later date, gotcha. um, and 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 kind of you know start to acknowledge each other as as being part of the same intellectual thrust. Like during your during your interviews, it seems like you gain a a great deal of insight into. Uh, like the inner workings of uh, the people that you're studying when they mention a writer or they reference somebody in passing. Um, like in the same way that I guess Bannon expressed some familiarity with Evola, you came to understand his familiarity with the works of Savitri Devi when he described uh, Trump as like a man against time, uh, mm -hmm. which is a, a Devian sort of term. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, man in time or against time or what have Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, like, uh, in your conversations with with Olavo, did the name Miguel Serrano come up, um, or oh, did he mention? Great question. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I would. It would have been wonderful to have asked. I'm sure he knows who Miguel Serrano is. Okay. It, it would be very strange if if he didn't. Um, you know, one thing that's not in the book was that Olavo was quite familiar with. Uh, with uh, Alain de Benoit, um, who is okay. who's a French. He, yeah, Alain de Benoit is, is, you know, an anti-liberal, anti-modern slash far right um, intellectual from France, and really the 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 front man of this the, this intellectual school called the French New Right, Nouvelle Droite. Okay. And and they're kind of they're parallel to traditionalism. They're not properly, I, you know, I wouldn't. They would never call themselves traditionalists. Uh, I don't, but they they're close to it, and and I think inspired by it in the same breath as they're inspired by uh, the you know German conservative revolution, Schmidt, things things like that. Um, so Olavo was you know was familiar with De Benoit. Olavo's students, notably the late the former I want to call him the late. Uh, foreign minister of Brazil, uh, Ernesto Araujo, seems to be referencing some terms from that that area too. So, mm. having that type of familiarity, it, it it wouldn't it would be very strange if if they didn't know about their regional, esoteric, extreme, modern traditionalist slash esoteric Hitlerist, is what Savitri Devi was. Uh, but Miguel Serrano, as you know, I mean, he was in contact with. Savitri Devi had this this understanding of polar shifting, and it so happened that living in Chile, he was very close to the South Pole, the North Pole, which is where the Aryans were going to reconvene. Um, so it, it yeah yeah it, it's okay it's, yeah quite a bit of stuff. It's unfortunately it's the sort of conversation I could never have with Olavo now. Right, right. I hear you. Um, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of weird to like. I mean, I don't even know how you would work that into a conversation. Like, hey, are you familiar with this esoteric Hitlerist? Uh, it's like, uh, <laughs> you know, it's it's not. It's it's kind of. It's a real know, I, song, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> which um, I'm gonna like kind of skip a couple of my questions and go to one that's more about. Um, and I wondered how you would feel about answering this because I, I know that you open your book in which you're. You're kind of you're leaving a meeting with Steve Bannon, and you're rushing to get to another meeting, and you you meet. I want to say it's like Jason Giorgiani at that point, and he hands you a book, and there's a note in it, and you kind of all at once find yourself maybe being a uh, 
a conduit for communication for these agents of the far right. And yes. so I wonder if you could maybe speak to, um, cause I don't, I don't think in your book you stopped for very long in your book to describe kind of the emotional impact of, or what you were dealing with in those moments in your own cognitive workings. Um, and I wonder if you could maybe speak to that. Um, and also more about like, I know in a, in a different academic paper, you described your methodology as something uh, as like an immoral ethnography. And I know that's kind of an, you were writing for academics at that point. So that's not the choice of words you would use. But I, you know, I was speaking to a different, uh, a different guest that I had on the show. And she was, uh, she embedded herself within Patriot Prayer for a while in order to observe their recruitment methods. And when I told her about your book and about how you described it as like, immoral ethnography she was like that's a really great term and so i for a person who conducts this kind of research that lives in this gray zone of ethics man i wonder if you could maybe just speak to some of that yeah it, it's one reason i'm kind of reluctant and why i didn't do it in the book is because there there aren't well, this fits the name of your podcast right there there are not easy answers it's not yeah. only that but i i don't have an internally coherent or logical philosophy of how it's all supposed to work but so okay. i'm i'm not a sympathizer of of the people that i study right politically um that's not always the most important thing to me but but more more to the point to be able to learn from them in the way that i want to their let's say their depravity or my disagreements with them or my opinion their their policy is that that can't bind everything. Right. Um, we need to form actual relationships with people. They have to be based on honest exchange. <laughs> they have to be long term. They have to be sustaining. And in many cases, especially in my old research in Sweden, they have to sustain across. They have to transcend major publications and interviews. Um, I'm still in dialogue with people who I wrote and published books about. So I haven't done this this thing that a lot of scholars seem to think is 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 novel and interesting which is where you befriend someone you you represent yourself falsely to someone to to you know and and grain yourself in their social world and then you betray all that and you publish your book you drop a bomb on them and you're gone right i've i've opted not to do that i i haven't misrepresented myself up front i don't publish books that are hit pieces um you know we can go into that as well but I try to sustain to su to sustain the contact. Um, if if I didn't do that, I would be sacrificing knowledge, and for a number of reasons, I don't. That's another branch of this. I don't think that that's worth it. Um, I sure. think we have plenty of knowledge produced by by way of surveillance. That's valuable knowledge. I don't deny that it it, it needs to be there, but that's not what um, that's not a complete picture, and that's it's not what I'm um, equipped to do. So. Um, I'm losing my. <laughs> that's, losing my that, that's okay, man. That's this is okay. what I'm talking about, Jules. When I get into yeah. the side, there's a million branches with it, but I I want to keep those relationships alive. And if you do that, it often it, it's often the case that you are not able to completely and always and all times track with what you think your political self wants to be doing all the time. I, I think it's I think it's really brave uh, what you've done, man. And um, you know I. I can't expect you to, I mean, I, let's just say that if you were out here giving interviews, giving full-throated condemnations of the folks you were interviewing, you would not be able to sustain those relationships. And so, uh, so I, I don't envy your position in that you have, uh, you have to study these people, you have to maintain a relationship with them. And you also are deliberately, um, maybe, uh, more in contact with, the humanity of folks that may be seen as sort of inhumane. It was like, for me, I, I, in watching January 6th, I found myself in my desire to understand the cognitive workings or the sort of, uh, the, the psychosocial reasons for the emergence of fascism in general. I started to take on more of a, I need to understand the emotional workings the cognitive workings and so i began to search for uh, a bit of the humanity and the inhumane amongst and, and so i so what i mean by that is that uh, you know people have told me like dude you don't debate fascism you smash the fash and i 
And I get that, but um, something Laura Jadid told me, uh, who was the, the lady who in, uh, embedded herself in Patriot Prayer, she was like, you know, the, the real thing is to not have to bash any fash anymore. You know, yeah. and, and so in order to arrive at that, you have to study these things and attempt to understand them. And and I think we all, if we're trying to figure this out, we're all doing that. But 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 you are straight up with the humanity of these people, and 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 really observing that side of it. And and I think that's a little too close to comfort for most people. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's it's too close for comfort to do it. Sometimes it's also too close for comfort to to read about it. But sure, you know, we've we've always said in almost any other genre of writing, let's say that uncomfortable readers are good readers. Sure. Um, for some reason, in the writing about the far right, that lesson it it's either forgotten or we're not being honest with ourselves about what is actually discomfort. Um, mm. you know, talking about how bad, oh, these people are even worse than you thought. Oh, they're worse than that person. So that's not discomfort. Uh, right. there's actually, that's, that's a backhandedly self self aggrandizing way of, of looking at these people. But to go back to set aside the question of comfort for a moment, that's, that's great that, I mean, I love hearing this Jules, as you might imagine. I, I think that's great that you want to see that more intimate more more human-like portrayal of actual human beings who are not you know right. not beings because we don't like their politics right i'm kind of convinced by that and i'm kind of stirred by that and excited to to kind of be where where i am with that but i can t- I tell you what convinces me more is is actually not being convinced by the opposite argument <laughs> <laughs> that's, what, that's what's more motivating for me is that the idea that we are going to smash the fash, that we are going to learn valuable lessons through a kind of surveillance, you know, uh, contemptuous kind of scoffing at, at these people who um, whose lives we actually know very little about. Um, th- that's what doesn't convince me. I'm, I'm right. st- it's not so much that I'm convinced by the kind of humanizing an ethnographic approach that, that nonetheless I've, I've embraced it's, it's more that the, the other stuff I think is an intellectual intellectually a waste of time, politically self-defeating, socially unappealing practice and, and way of, way of going about things. It's, it also, to the extent that it um, is fearful of the idea of empathy, I think yeah. it, I th- and, and it often is people mix empathy and sympathy, but you know, you know, just being able to see the world more clearly through someone else's eyes mean that you endorse it. It's not a statement or a, 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 a mark of approval. It's just being able to see well, what what does this look like to someone else. To the extent that the standard paradigm is is fearful, contemptuous, mocking toward the idea of empathy. I also think it is plain old anti-intellectualism. Empathy is sure. knowledge. And when we reject empathy, we are rejecting knowledge. We are saying that we do not want it. And if you reject knowledge in order to preserve your discourse and your account of someone else, the problem is with you. <laughs> it's not with the empathy. It's yeah. it's one of, you know, it's a soapbox topic for me that um, that that I wish we could have more more conversation about. Um, because pe- there's a lot of rejection of knowledge so that we can talk about other people in the way that we want to, we want, we have been talking about, we want to continue talking about them. That's a problem. That's a real problem. Yeah. You know, I mean, I feel like, you know, some of the critiques of liberalism that come out of the traditionalist school are fascinating, but it's also, they're so different that like, um, so for, so, uh, I, there's like I, I plan on releasing this interview with like uh, an episode before it that's a very long monologue interview in which I uh, sort of talk about how uh, not many people in our lives uh, I don't think we have someone who like thinks of democracy as like a primitive form of government and loathes <laughs> it and thinks it's like an awful thing right I mean even if yeah. the most extreme among us like if say if uh, some guy thinks that the constitution is wholly illegitimate right and then there's another guy that thinks uh a dictatorship of the proletariat is more democratic than the state capitalist uh things we have now both of those people still think democracy is a good thing you know and so they're they're still on that side but these folks um folks of the traditionalist mindset uh you know they 
they consider democracy to be one of the most primitive forms of government. And um, I started, in some of my research for this interview, I, I, I started reading a book called um, The Case Against the Modern World, which is a play on an old Gwinnon title of a book, obviously. And uh, But it's like a crash course in traditionalism. And this guy was talking about how if you had 10 cavemen in a cave and 7 out of 10 of them wanted to go outside... Uh, then it's an easy to imagine the seven of them making the other three oblige, and it's in that way that democracy implies force. And so this, to me, was a criticism that, I mean, I thought the works of Carl Schmitt were kind of, like, mind-blowing, or, or maybe <laughs> even, like, Agamben at that point, expounding upon that stuff, was, you know, kind of like, wow, this is really expanding my worldview. But then you get to this, holy <laughs> shit. Yeah, dude, like... I, so, yeah. so then you get to you get to uh, uh, this guy. Uh, I forget his name, the guy that wrote it. But in talking about how um, democracy implies force, and you know, I just I just thought that the that's why they're gravitating towards this because of this sort of scathing critique of of a democracy in general. I think absolutely, and it's not just. I mean, democracy, equality, freedom, right. Yeah. Even if you're on the left, we, we understand those things differently, right? We have our own, the, the left and the right have their, each have their own understandings of what real equality should mean and, and, and also what freedom is, but they, no one wants to call themselves anti-freedom. Right. They call themselves anti someone else's version of freedom, but they'll have their own that they espouse. So we see, we see rejection of these pillars and, and this Again, this is where traditionalism enters a territory of of contrast with the status quo that we're we're really, if we're being honest with ourselves, we're not used to seeing. We love to think that our whoever our chosen ideological opponents are are just so bad, and oh, they're getting they're getting more extreme all the time. They're actually actually not. When you when you look at traditionalism, you see how much in common actually people have in a lot of these liberal democracies. And, yeah. and how small our political spectrum actually is. I mean, the the um the critique of like democracy was one thing, but I it, it kind of it hit me like a ton of bricks when I understood their sort of critique of freedom had more to do with like maybe the rise of the human subject and like the removal of a external sort of standard that gave humanity a sort of objective aim and objective morality, you'd even say, or like a telos in the universe that is now gone. And so they're like, they're upset at like the container of the human subject being the sole measure of the good or something, you know, they're, they're up. So. Yes. Yeah. And, and it's, it refers to progressivism as well, as well. In many cases, some, some thinkers who have kind of studied traditionalism kind of moved into their own, their own space with it. See this idea of, of becoming rather than being sure as as underlying a lot of modern versions of freedom if it's the if it's the economic neoliberal kind of version of freedom then it's the fact that we have to always be building up capital and you can you can never be in a in a sustainable position with your economic life if it's the left-wing version it's this it's the idea that our identities let's say are, are need to be flowing and there should never be anything about us that's given um, and, and really that that's a historical oppression and a lie that we've taught ourselves that something is ever just fixed in stone if it's tied to our body or something. But that instead that we're, we're always in this place of movement, we are never being, we are always becoming, um, that that's, that's really what freedom is. That's how we exercise freedom is, is by getting ourselves in that state of being and, and, and experiencing it. Whereas the traditionalists, it, it's built into this time cycle we are and, and not recognize the fact that we are bound to being what we have been in the past um, and that there is a stillness and a consistency and a sort of eternity that 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 we can choose to recognize or we can rebel against and rebelling against it is is one of the great lies of the dark age. Um, that's 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 a topic yes it has political consequences but it, it veers into into a, an entirely different territory Right, right. I, I get the feeling that, like, I think what's most unsettling, most dangerous that I have seen is that I guess it's come to my attention because I, I'm a non-spiritual person, dude. Like, I'm a total atheist, and I atheism has taken on like this uh, wider encompassment of like 
uh, denial of the supernatural in addition to denial of like the existence of God. And so mm-hmm. things like metaphysics, things like uh, miracles or, you know, things like that, I, I explicitly have a, have a non-belief and, and kind of a, a harbored contentment or uh, contempt mm-hmm. for. Um, but I will say that I think that there has come to my attention that, that like it seems like society and not that there's like a resurgence of religiosity, but that there is like this latent thirst for the spiritual within our secular society and that um, society being secular has, has forced a, a, a more drastic individuation and atomization. Uh, so this like micro political has popped up, as you were saying, is like we're f- always further refining and defining how we identify um so this latent thirst for the spiritual um it seems like it, this is a recognized observation by uh this is an observation made by people like dugan and and to probably evola as well and that they just wanted to not necessarily take the political compass and make it more left or more right but just raise the entire thing like infuse spirituality mm-hmm. within this political spectrum and so that in combination with the sort of openness and susceptibility that we have in secular society, I, I think is a super dangerous uh, sort of thing. And I wonder if if, if the danger is there be, because of the open, uh, because it's actually a black hole. When we start to talk about spirituality, if I start to say, okay, well, I, I yearn toward the transcendent. Right. Or, or people to pick up your conversation and say, yeah, people are disgruntled and they want to be part of something bigger than themselves. I've said something, but it's more interesting to, to note how little that actually says. That says, okay, I want some other agenda to be guiding us here. Um, and, and I can fill that with all sorts of meaning. Right. I can put I can put a range of, of of different agendas or accounts of history or definitions of humanity and human beings mm-hmm. and human society in into that into that spot. Um, but one of the benefits of a secularized, rationalized, modernist you know way of organizing society, at least, is is the the sort of tangibility and the transparency of some of its concepts. That's also mm-hmm. its failing. Um, because it's 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 sort of unwilling to address aspects of the human condition that it can't easily quantify, measure, so mm-hmm. on and so forth. But, but at the very least, um, you know, we're talking about money. We are talking about population. We are talking about you know very very tangible elements of of how we're going to live our lives and and how we're going to move around and relate to other people. Um, and and it's. It's not that easy if, if we're talking about rational political behavior. It's not that easy to take anyone for a ride, to tell them that they have something that they actually don't have. Um, you know, whereas if you say, okay, I'm going to take the United States on a spiritual mission, right? And I want to see all the souls of, of, of America, all the Americans, you know, make, make a spiritual transition. <laughs> I don't know what the hell that would, that would mean. <laughs> Right, right. I mean, all this stuff sounds a lot cooler in the abstract, you know. I it mean, sounds great we... because right. because I think there's there's some there's a reason why it speaks because I do think that we have a need for that. In the same yeah. way, it's it's uh, as as I said in the book, it's kind of a you know a picture frame with nothing in the middle. Yeah, um, you know, with a big, a cloaked and obscured, shrouded center. <laughs> core to it and there might be nothing there mm. and that that should be mm. no no more settling to anybody but uh but it but it's e- it's much easier to take people for a ride i think when you start speaking in those terms that aren't measurable that aren't definable yeah you know something else one of these traditionalist guys i've been listening to mentioned was that um that the the sacred in society cannot be Uh, done away with like you just can't get rid of it he would contend that the sacred can only be transferred and that that got me really thinking about how on january 6 they they described the events as like a desecration which you know desecration has like kind of an overtly religious or connotation to it and to like 
to desecrate something is to deprive something of its sacred properties, right? <laughs> and so mm -hmm. I started thinking about how, okay, well, we treat the Capitol building as sacred. And that got me thinking, oh, wait a second. Actually, the government, uh, maybe I'm just realizing this or what have you, but it's 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 become kind of a place of liberal worship and that it's adopted certain uh, structural tenets of religion and like the between the monuments and the, the in God we trust on the currency and the mythology of the founding fathers. And, mm -hmm. and so I, so it got me wondering in a way, it was like, what's the point of the separation of church and state if the state just becomes a church, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, uh, and so I, so I wonder I, on all of this, man, uh, is it's, I, I mean, I'm not sympathetic to the traditionals, obviously, but I think they have some really good fucking points that are really difficult to argue against, man. And one of those is like the, the transfer of the sacred and that like, I mean, for Christ's sake, we have, we have flags with burial rites, you know, yeah. like it's, it's. It's so I so I wonder to what degree, man, like and, and I don't know if this is more of a question or an observation or something, but like I just I, I think there's been like kind of a transfer of the sacred to um to places of liberal worship and uh and I mean maybe they're right on that modernity is certainly having an effect on religious traditions to the way that they, it's society is adopting different cultural practices and stuff like that at this point. Oh yeah. I mean, first, I think, I, I think you're right, and that doesn't need to beautify traditionalism. I think that one, and perhaps maybe this is one of the scarier, more threatening aspects of this story that that these ideas are not just pure nonsense, and we should never expect there to be. It, it, it's as unlikely right. as, as as challenging for someone to come up with an ideology that is 100. percent well, it's also, it's also scary when I'm like fucking Dugan is quoting uh, Deleuze and, and, and Heidegger and shit. And I'm like, wait a second, man. You're not supposed to be. Keep those guys out your mouth, bro. You know? So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Derrida, <laughs> yeah I mean, yeah, that, that, ha that, that happens. These are these are not stupid people. These, these are right. not people. And, then, you know, they might do stupid things all the time. We shouldn't get too excited about that because we all do as well. Sure. Um, but. To, to go to the specific point that you were making, um, one thing Evola wrote about this and some other people on the French New Right picked this up, this, this uh, a notion of substitution or, you know, substitute. Mm. But, you know, what you were describing would probably be labeled as, you know, as, as a form of substitution that, okay, we've lost public spirituality. Yes, we think America is, you know, is this hyper-religious society, but, you know, maybe we've we've lost kind of formal public spirituality, so we've transferred, we made the state a sort of substitute for, for the old sacred. Um, some other commentators, Tomislav Sunich is a, you know, kind of white nationalist furry. He kind of picked that mm -hmm. up and has spoken, written about it. Um, in terms of ethnic identity, that okay, we have in the in the United States in particular, we've stripped away the the ability for young people to recognize and make their ethnic identity socially meaningful, you know, beyond uh, "Kiss Me, I'm Irish" T-shirt or bump a right. Finger. And so, in place of that that need for tribalism, we've come up with substitutes, and maybe that sports spectatorship, or it's you know, I live in Colorado. Maybe it's what brand of snowboarding gear you you know advertise on your T-shirt and um, you know, or I'm in a university Greek life, you know, and wow, you have sisters and brothers, you can recreate, you know, a, a sort of hereditary tribe. And, and that the allegation is, is that there's actually not a complete loss. It, it, it's not like that's an airtight process moving from the actual object to the substitute. Um, and that as you move forward, there's bleeding and there's also dissatisfaction. And we're going to we're going to kind of run through our substitutes. They're never quite going to satisfy what the original satisfied. And so we're going to be nervously looking for more um, and, and shuffling through them. There could be a truth to all that. Right. There's right. something that I don't I don't. Uh, I don't see ethnic identity as being as meaningful and as, as, you know, transcendently important to people um, in the way that those thing those thinkers do. But if, if you transfer that into the realm of spirituality, maybe there's something to that. And it certainly wouldn't speak well of our commitment to liberal democracy. If, if really liberal democracy was just a transitory band-aid for the loss um, right. that is eventually going to leave us feeling dissatisfied and we're going to change out for something else um, that that attempts to address um, 
you know, something that, that we needed addressed from the past. You had this, uh, you had this analogy of a triangle in your book that was like, it was like a triangle, but instead of having horizontal lines, there were vertical lines. And I think you, you meant to relate that to, um, like ethnic identity or national identity or something like that. But I was wondering if you could maybe explain that analogy uh, to listeners. I think that's incredibly helpful in uh, parsing out what the sort of uh, social vision is for the school of traditionalists. Yeah, and this is really Steve Bannon. Okay. I was gotcha. trying to trying to come up with a way to characterize and visualize his, his uh, changes to more standard traditionalist thinking. So, if in that historic Evola, Evolian based traditionalist or Gononian uh, traditionalist understanding, a, a social hierarchy should have, just like we would think about any kind of pyramid hierarchy with, uh, with horizontal lines, you know, a tiny little triangle at the top of a priestly elite, followed by a slightly bigger one, warriors, then merchants, and finally that underlayer of, of slaves at the bottom. Bannon. I think trying to fit all this into the ideals of American social mobility mm. and, you know, and, and, you know, the self-made man uh, myth in the United States. Right. Said, okay. Well, I don't like the idea of there being impermeable boundaries from the bottom to the top. Right. I mm. want people throughout their lives to be able to transition from the bottom to the top. It's, it's, it's a, again, a version of sort of our economic narrative in the United States. He said, well, you might start out at the bottom, but I want to see people, you know, following their own path, make the transition to spiritual deepening. And it, it became more clear, especially the more that I talked about him, that it, he himself and he thinks other people and, and nations need to allow there to be separate channels. So you can't really move, uh, you can't really move vertically. You need to stick in your channel, and this is this also is a traditionalist ideal, of course, for individual traditionalists. This is not as as innovative, I think, maybe as I made it made it seem in the book for him. Um, that you know, you choose your path up the mountain, and you stick to it, and you climb the mountain, right? And uh, and that's that's what he wanted to see happen in his mind. That's what needed to happen in the United States. He wanted to see the white working class be given the tools, the opportunity, have the barriers pulled away so that they could make this transition up uh, from materialistic slave values to values of priests. He wanted them all to become priests, and he thought that they were the most, uh, the, the best position to do that. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's such a trip, man, talking to you about this book, because it's, it's, it's kind of, I mean, it's, it's sort of... Uh, uh, it's opened up my my mind to other ways of perceiving the far right, but it's also it somehow made me make sense of Marianne Williamson all of a sudden. It's like, <laughs> you know, like I, I didn't really understand what the Democratic primary is with this, uh, you know, woman on stage talking about a dark psychic energy and why is she like, you know, I I, I the other day, I mean, it was funny. I I went back and forth with her for a second on Twitter because she she tweeted something like. Uh, if we could all just open our hearts and channel love to every living creature on earth for two minutes a day, there would be a, a giant shift that we would all feel. And, uh, and I just retweeted, I was like, this kind of thing is going to get us all killed, man. This is like, I don't know. That, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, so, so she responded, she was like, no, what we're doing now is going to get us all killed. And I'm like, I'm like no, this is, I, I, and I just couldn't even, resp I was like, yeah. So anyway, so I, I feel like this this like latent thirst for the spiritual is felt on both sides of the of the political spectrum. And so Marianne Williamson, after reading about traditionalism, really made a lot more sense to me. And I wonder if you kind of I don't know well, if you have a similar perspective to that end. Well, I mean, it's it's not surprising when if if you start to think that well these traditionalists they're not really interested in right or left for them it's a matter of you know high or low right. Um, and that they should like people who are ostensibly their political opposites, but that are in their their kind of vertical terror. That's that's what was behind Bannon's admiration for Miriam Williamson. I said right in the book that Bannon was trying to get me to you know promote her in some way. Wow! I think wow. recognizing that you know she was a little bit more in my political territory than he was, and and also knowing that I studied this stuff. Mm -hmm. 
you know, but he, he loved the way she was speaking and, and he felt like she was actually in tune with what was most important about politics, not what the marginal tax rate should be. Right. But the, the question, you know, if, if, if I were to try and analyze what you're talking about, the, you know, the fear is, okay, so what happens to our basic material needs, to practical politics, if our discourse ends up in the clouds where they want it to be? <laughs> Perfectly said, uh, yeah. You know, and in, in Bannon's case, you know, he has these grand visions of a, you know, of a revolution in, in, in the Republican Party and a revolution in the United States, and he gets Trump, who he thinks... Yeah, despite the crassness, is actually this eschatological figure who's coming to destroy and move a time cycle forward, all this stuff. And what happens? Uh, corporate tax rates go down, right? <laughs> something, something very, the, the tangible product was something very unpopular at the moment in, in elections around the world right now. That, that free market, center right, you know, Thatcher, Reagan. Mm-hmm. You know, kind of uh, politics is really unpopular right now. And the critics is that, well, all this is there to actually repackage it. Populism, you know, racism is actually not the core of the agenda here. Racism is the selling point. And nationalism yeah. is the selling point. And, and it's going to be used to just actually push through boring, um, offensive economic policies. And you could say, you could say, look at traditionalism, you could look at these these figures and say, well, here we see that distracting discourse on crack. Mm. Right? We're not even talking about anything, you know, remotely terrestrial. Yeah. And that's going to provide the cover for something, something else that actually is going to impact our, our everyday lives a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's a question uh, concerning the traditionalism or traditionalists. Like, uh, does the spirituality come before the racism, or does the racism become come before the spirituality? And what I mean by that is that, you know, I I, I wondered as I was researching Avila, I'm like, how much of this is just a giant shroud to cover uh, advocation for an old style uh, Aristo feudalism or something, you know, aristocratic mm-hmm. feudalism, or um, and then I and then that question is made more complicated when I look at kind of the mirroring that I sense out of Dugan and Evola in that uh, you know Evola was trying to like I guess how did I write this down it's kind of a uh, the most unsettling thing is that there's a very heavy dose of Evolian thought in Dugan Evola wanted to add a primacy of spirit to the fascist movement of the time and when I hear Dugan speak about transcendence as it relates to his fourth political theory I can really see like a mirroring there mm-hmm. um, and so mm-hmm. so yeah so I just wonder like I mean is it the spirituality or the racism or is it one covering for the other or is like you said a selling point but like there is that mirroring of like a transcendent centered sense of politics um Mm -hmm. maybe you could speak to Mm -hmm. that uh, yeah i mean the allegation against dugan even from from within traditionalism from kind of critical voices who who identify as traditionalists is that all of that is window dressing for russian imperialism ah right right. yeah and and that's the actual core. It's not even you know the if, if you look at the function of those ideas, whether or not they come from Dugan or not. Um, if if you look at Putin, let's say you know he he doesn't become a he doesn't become a the same type of historical figure that he is today until he starts to have a message, right? Until there's some other message than Putin, right? And Russia, right? It, without any any ideological mission or campaign behind it conservatism i don't think you know Putin's not going to sit down and read Rene Gonon or anything like that but conservatism becomes his banner and his cause and it's what what also opens up a lot of doors from in europe it's suddenly you know political parties are aligning with him you know not because they just like russia but because they see him as a defender of you know the, traditional marriage or something like that well, i think you yeah. know in borders and christianity religion and yeah. and so that you see you see it functioning that way and uh and it really is being you know raw real politique 
um, expansion for for Russia. That that that's what people have seen in in, in Dugan. Um, you know, in Bannon's case, you know, he says that okay, we close the border. Um, you know, we stop American expansions. We redefine the United States as being not, you know, not not essentially about democracy and enlightenment values and human rights and all that stuff. And that will force us to close in on ourselves a little bit more. And why do you want to do that? And why do you want to put tariffs on things? And all the 20 questions, it all gets down to, in, in his mind, um, I want the white working class to go on a spiritual journey. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> is, that, is that BS? It certainly could be. And I've met people uh, in outside, not just in this study, but in my other eth- ethnographic work where it's like, yes. Mm-hmm. This is you, you are a nativist, you are a xenophobe, and you don't, you won't just want to be fancy about it. Right? Yeah. Just calling yourself a white nationalist is, is not quite enough for you for whatever personal reasons. There are other times when that's not the case. And um, I can, I can tell you being, you know, a public commentator, it's much, much easier to talk about the former example than it is the other. To, to tell you know journalists or academic colleagues that you know what this to say that it's all just about racism is actually doesn't quite cover everything right uh, right here so I'm you know and in Bannon's case I'm not really sure I don't take a stand on that in the book because mm. I I don't have a, an answer that I'm really satisfied with well, it's, it's funny you say like calling yourself a neo-fascist isn't enough uh, when referring to Dugan when like maybe calling yourself a fascist wasn't enough for Evola. There's like another mirror in there where like Evola was <laughs> yeah. like, no, nah, man, I'm a super fascist, you know? And, and Dugan's like, uh, no, I'm not just a neo-fascist. I'm, you know, something more broader and encompassing than that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but I, but I do think that like, it's interesting, man. I, I hadn't, I mean, it seems flat on its face, kind of obvious, but yeah, like Russian imperialism seems to be the zero sum game that like all of this on, on in Dugan's section of this, uh, what it comes down to, uh, but I think he's really making effective use of the overlaps between conservatism and traditionalism at that point, because he, mm-hmm. he's, you know, the worship of precedence, right? Like, of course, Russia is bound to go into this sort of, uh, you know, worship of precedence to get back to, you know, they're, they're in the middle of trying to piece back together parts that they lost with the USSR when that fell apart, but also like, Maybe a restoration of like uh, something akin to Rome and the fall of Constantinople in a way. So. Yeah, and, and and you know the backdrop of that also is that they feel and Putin feels like he tried progressivism and liberalism. Mm. Yeah, you know, he tried very briefly at the, at the beginning of his reign to be you know kind of a participant in this in a in a global system where. You know, they would modernize, liberalize, uh, and it didn't happen. Um, that you know, some of the narrative is that well, the rest of the world doesn't actually play fairly, and you know, poor Russia, and and it never happened. Um, another way to look at it is that you know, the society was so thoroughly corrupt. A more, a more you know, gratifying narrative for the West is that Russian society was so corrupt, and they couldn't actually have any sort of liberalization not ever take place within their borders. And so it, it was a fake attempt. And after that insincere try, then they turned down toward this path of, of anti-liberal nationalism. Right. I, so part of what I've been, what I've been writing about lately, um, it's funny because I, I noticed this sort of like latent spiritual thirst, right? And the society becoming even more secular leaves us more wanting for something more than that. And, um, but I, I, at the end of this sprawling like uh, essay that turned into a monologue, that, that honestly you're responsible for, brother. So, uh, um, but at the at, at the end of all this shit that I wrote, man, it's like twenty thousand words or something. Um, it really did. It, it what I was trying to do is like we we've spoken about the sort of overlap of conservative politics and traditionalism, but really like I'm, I was trying to find an overlap between traditionalism, fascism, and new age thought. Because with with this sort of increasing number of people identifying as spiritual but not religious, um, and maybe becoming uh, syncretists themselves in that maybe they take the yoga out of the Hindu tradition and the praying out of the Abrahamic religions, uh, I mean, this is like the number one thing on Umberto Eco's Ur fascism list, right? So maybe this late wanting of spirituality 
uh, is actually kind of leaving us wide open to the traces of fascism. And so I wonder if you could, it, because I, it's very easy for me to find the overlaps between conservatism and traditionalism, but as far as like why Umberto Eco called out the shelves of the New Age bookstore, or like the shelves labeled New Age in bookstores, right? And where all of this overlaps with uh, the New Age thought processes, um, I wonder if you could maybe speak to that. Yeah. Well, I, I forget if the term is a culture, a culture, yeah, something. There's, right. there's some kind of, uh, right. you know, hybrid Portmaya yes. term for that. But the there, the shared conceptual spaces that I, I see it, there, there are two that, that really matter that, you know, that you'll see both in, you know, extreme right wing politics and in your local metaphysical bookstore, which I love going into. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just the, just the atmosphere. I always like it. right, right. Um, the one of them is the idea of a fixed essence and an inherited mm. essence for all of us. Um, it, you know, you see in a lot of these these teachings uh, an emphasis on returning to who you really are. You know, and your that your self actualization is not about a pure reinvention, but it's about it's it's a process of return. And most often that process of return is, is understood in ethnic racial terms. Mm. Um, you know, my, my father uh, has spent a lot of time, like a lot of, you know, kind of Jewish Americans is very interested in Buddhism. Sure. Uh, that's, you know, that's a pretty common, common phenomenon. And, you know, I studied in, in some of those circles and was having a conversation with someone. My dad loves trees. He loves okay. the forest. Right. And was having a conversation with some teacher and they were in this very territory and the teacher was saying, oh, yeah, you need to kind of, you know, find your essence part. And, you know, well, what was his environmental essence? Where should he find himself? And the teacher's like the desert. Wow. Yeah. No shit. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Jewish, desert, palace. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, of, you know, of course, that's what you're, you're going to say. Under, underlying a lot of it is a sort of racial essentials. I wouldn't put it in those terms, but that's what that's oftentimes what it needs. That's that's one thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When, when we were speaking earlier about, you know, being rather than becoming, mm-hmm. uh, that is coded in a lot of new age thinking. And a lot of it is race racially understood. I will go out on the record and, and say that. Right. The second thing, um, and, and this is this is maybe a little bit more uh, transparent to us, is a broad, encompassing uh, rejection of uh, institutional knowledge and modern mm. knowledge, um, scientific knowledge, and that can be medicine. <laughs> That can be, you know, other humanistic fields, um, social history, sociology, anthropology, but the, you know, official accounts of who we are, of how our bodies work, of how we work socially, um, you know, physics, our understanding of the cosmos, all of those, all of those, those bodies of thought are almost by definition rejected by new age, (laughs) Um, or alternative spirituality. That's that's really their their calling. Um, that's how they distinguish themselves. And from there, it's it's really a small conspiracism. And a lot of New Age bookstores have a conspiracist shelf and section. Right. right. To it. And it belongs there because this this is about thinking that there is a widespread, orchestrated, organized campaign of confusion. Um, which, and misinformation. Which ultimately, if you follow any conspiracy theory to its end, you normally arrive at just some form of anti-Semitism. So there's, it can be, right? Yeah. That's, 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 a, that's a, a really widespread sure. one, isn't it? Is that Jews are the avatars of modernity and, and all of these different incarnations of it. Um, you know, the banking system, education, communism, capitalism, you know, medical research, that it's all, you know, Jews, Jews can be all of that, even, right. you know, even though it's internally conflicted. Right, it's, right. it's modernistic. So, and, and the proposed solution for, uh, for that impasse that a lot of, the, a lot of New Age sees, it, it's not necessarily a rejection of the past. It's a matter of skipping the recent past. And going to modern past and finding the teachings then that that can illuminate your present now. Mm. So there's also a, a, a reactionary element to it. 
um, and an anti-progressive. I mean, sometimes they combine it. They say, and this is even more classically fascist, that, okay, well, we're going to return to the past and we're going to reinvent the past. We're going to create an alternative modernity. We're going to have a paleogenetic rebirth of, of ancient knowledge. Right. And, you know, then we're really in, in some similar territory here. And a lot, a lot of the, you know, there, there are people who have studied this, um, uh, and, and I'm, they're, I'm missing not just uh, Nicholas Goodrick Clark, but um, Jocelyn Godwin mm. uh, have studied especially like proto Nazi intellectual currents and how they were very much mixed in with New Age slash Green environmentalist ideas. That's not to say I'm an environmentalist. That's not to say that we should just group them all together and and throw them all in a big hole. But it, it's it's uh, you know to point out all the conceptual overlap there. Yeah, you know, I think, uh, I mean, I wouldn't describe, you know, like your modern sort of liberal who is spiritual but not religious as somebody who is anti-modern because I don't think that that's like an accurate way to describe them. But I but I do think their natural sort of disposition is not like, it's not exactly pro-modernity uh, either. In, in a way, it's like I feel like the ideological capstone of most folks who consider themselves spiritual but not religious is like, becoming more of your authentic self. Like the ideological capstone is like a reaffinement mm-hmm. or a refining of like who we are into more of ourselves. And so, yes. so it, it, it's in that way, I feel like that person, they're not anti-modern, but I think their natural disposition is to view modernity as an obstacle to be overcome in their process of becoming their more authentic self. So I don't, so I don't yes. think they're like combative, but I think they're just naturally sort of, not uh in a place that's exactly anti-modern you know yeah yes but i i think that your characterization jewel is they see modernity as an obstacle um you know perhaps there's a a distinction to be made between that and viewing modernity as a deliberate attempt to confuse Mm. Mm. or enslave right right you know I i think we're on a spectrum there right so it's not like uh the spiritual but not religious would be wanting to destroy modernity that's clearly like something that like uh traditionalists uh kind of t- to a degree hold in common yeah um, and they yeah. might not have a comparable it's not it's not as though that all of the positions laid out by the anti-modernists are going to have a correlate by someone else i mean it's I, i'm not sure that all the the spiritual but not religious people have a stance on what they want to do about modernity right right um, right you know, so, so, but you see also, I mean, people will talk about the religious, um, the religious instinct um, or the religious mindset. You know, people will say, okay, yeah, I'm not part of a religious movement or I'm not part of a congregation anyway, but I think I have the religious instincts. And usually when people are saying that, they mean, you know, that they, they have a yearning to see nature as being enchanted. Right. Um, or they want to, they, they find themselves looking for and taking pleasure in being able to, to, you know, view themselves as being part of a, a greater narrative. Um, you know, they don't want to see complete chaos and circumstance animating human history, their present and their future. Um, you know, and, and that they, they also are attracted to or comforted by the notion that some element of themselves or their beings will live on past the lifetime of their physical body. Right. You know, all, all of those, all of those things, um, you know, that describes me. Um, I, I, sure. I recognize myself in a lot of those ideas, but there's, I, again, that, that says very little about what, you know, what somebody will do with those, with those ideas. Right. And, and that kind of, you know, I guess towards like when I'm trying to put a bow on this 20,000 word thing I was writing, I think what it comes down to is that like you can't encourage like spiritual abstinence because it's part of the human condition and people are going to seek out some sort of spirituality, right? So mm-hmm. in a way, it's kind of like to say hey, practice safe spirituality. Like if you want to see yourself, <clears throat> you know, if you want to see nature as something that's enchanted, that's cool. You can look at a tree and that all sounds you know, good in the mm-hmm. abstract, if you want to say God can be anything, God can be a tree. Great, cool. But the moment you pull that out of the abstract is the moment it's a cult mm-hmm. or it's just crazy or what have you. Um, 
But I guess, you know, in terms of, like, practicing safe spirituality, if you want to see the forest as a fucking enchanted place, that's cool, but don't fall into, like, the anti-human pessimism of, like, the impeachment uh-huh. of man or deep ecology or something to that end, right? So I feel like you're always, a, like, a like a hair away from something with uh, fascistic sort of overtones to it, man. Uh-huh. And, and, uh-huh. and so, so, so that's kind of, I guess that's kind of my mission in, in terms of, like, the research I did out of your book and stuff is, like, just wear a condom when you practice uh, spirituality at this point because if there's so many different slippery slopes that can lead to fatalistic and pessimistic uh world views out of it and these are all kind of thoughts that are common in society like we even during covid when you hear somebody say oh no nah, man humans are the virus and it's like you motherfucker that is some <laughs> anti-human pessimism like thomas malthus inspired stuff going on it's so, all killed yeah yeah yeah, it, it's, I, I, I think that, that when you, when you say that, you know, spirituality or the need for it as part of the human condition, I, I, I'm, I'm with you there. And I'm also with you in wanting to treat this as something that is volatile. You know, it's like fire. It, 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 it can do great things for us and it can also burn down the whole town. And for us we often talk about this and you began this interview you were asking me about my status as a music scholar one thing that i i i like talking about in music is is the fact that a lot of music research a lot of writing and intellectualism relating to music ignores all the parts of music that are mysterious to us you know sometimes i actively poo-poos them and would ostracize scholars who are very interested in talking about them um, and then gravitates towards, you know, all the things that we can talk about. And over time, we end up with this definition of music that is, is not music, right? It's, you know, we can talk about all of its material properties. We can say, okay, you know, this song combines these tones. But, you know, what the, the interesting thing about music is the interaction of different tones together. Right. You know, it's, it's when that starts to take place that it, it it becomes something else. It becomes something more than it's just the sum of its parts. We start to get scared when that is going on because we 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 just don't have the tools to describe it. And and there's something of that going on with spirituality as well. These dimensions of of who we are that's a challenging discussion to have. It's really left to philosophers and specialists. And and that that might can contribute to all of this. That that you know that means that we are going to surrender that vital but difficult conversation to someone else right it's going to stand in an empty yeah. room and you do not get to choose who comes by and picks it up and adds meaning to it for you but you're not going to ignore it and you're not going to get very far telling people that that there is nothing to see there just because it's a struggle for you to talk about or anyone who starts to talk about it is going to stumble i don't know my thoughts my thoughts, Jules, on that. On that. <laughs> yeah. No, man. I, I like the way you said it, though. It's that, like, you know, it, it can it can warm you, but it can also like burn the entire town down. And mm-hmm. um, and, and that's kind of, I mean, so much of my life has been spent, uh, you know, with from the time I was a teenager, like I had a resentment and uh, towards religion and theology, and so uh, it it. it for reasons that I maybe could not articulate at mm-hmm. that point, uh, being a teenager, you're just mad because you don't want to go to church service or something, right? You get yeah. a little bit older, and then you like maybe you expand your 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 criticisms out to re- organize religion as a whole. But maybe the maybe the way to articulate a more comprehensive critique over the whole thing, I don't think I really had that vocabulary until I committed a great deal of thought towards the things you were writing about, brother, and the things that. Um, that were being called to my attention and this greater debate between are we just, uh, I don't know, secular society building towards a utopia or are we just uh, everything's been downhill since the Garden of Eden kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. So so it's at this point now, man, I guess uh, in terms of wrapping up, um, I uh, so I'll ask you this and and this doesn't have to be included. If you told me not to include it, I will I will edit this part out, brother. OK. But I, I got the feeling, and I and I didn't know if this was accurate or not. Um, when when Savitri Devi 
looked at Hitler as the avatar for Lord Vishnu in the Kali Yuga. And then Steve Bannon uh, referred to Trump as like a man in time. Do you think or did you receive any indication that Bannon started to think of Trump as an avatar for Lord Vishnu in the Kali Yuga at that point? Yes. Wow. I mean, I wanted to suggest that rather than make it as a, a full-blown argument. And I tried to give the reader all the indications that I had. Here, here's the information you have to work with. Mm -hmm. A, he's very scattered. He's a scattered thinker. He remembers things one day, right. he forgets the next. And it's mm -hmm. not, without getting too far into details, it's not that, you know, he's just lucky that he's throwing up a bunch of words and I'm piecing them together myself. He knows what he's talking about and then he gets distracted and he kind of will forget a name or miss, you know, misattribute a quote or something like that. Um, he's both scattered and extremely well read and, and knowledgeable. Both, both things are true. Mm -hmm. We have that going on. We have the fact that he uses a peculiar phrase to describe Trump. He calls Trump a man in time. You right. know, I can never really quite decide if I think that that's a common phrase that someone who knows nothing about Savitri Devi would say, but I think in general, no. Right. Um, you know, man of the times, um, sure. you know, we, we have other phrases to say that. So Bannon once says that but Trump is a man in time. And then he goes on at a later date to me uh, to describe Trump as a man in time, quite succinctly, accurately, um, you know, with for in, by his standards uh, in articulate terms, it says Donald Trump, his role in history is to destroy. It does not matter that he understands that his role in history is to destroy. In fact, you know, Bannon relays a conversation the two of them had. Trump is is thinking to himself, his definitions of, of himself is that he is a creator, the opposite of a destroyer. Bannon says, okay, you know what, big boy, you can go play with your toys. You go on thinking that you're a creator. It's fine. It doesn't matter what you think. Your mind is not what is important here. It's your actions and you are a destructive force. And that's what, that's what makes you who you are. Uh, so yes, that those, those are the three elements that we, all right. We have, we have the use of the phrase. We have Bannon describing Trump accurately as being that type of figure in part of this, in, in a conversation about cyclic time and everything. Um, he doesn't, he pretends that he, or he, pretends, he says that he does not know who Savitri Devi is to me, that my experience with him, that does not need to mean anything. He could either actively have been trying to deceive or he, in that moment might not have remembered her name. He might remember her name at another time. He does that. Wow. So all those, all those things are, are going on. It also seems to frame Bannon as being a man against time. <laughs> Right, someone who destroys, uh, and and in contrast to the Trump figure, knows what they're doing, destroys with wow. a purpose. Wow. So so yeah, I I, I see okay. those things there. I didn't want to quite. I didn't think that the data, to use a, a kind of a crude term, that I didn't think the data quite let me make an argument about it, but it suggested all of that. Wow. Wow, man. Well, this has been an amazing conversation, Ben. I can't thank you enough for just hanging out and meeting with me and talking about this stuff. Um, Likewise, Jules. Wonder, wonderful questions and great to hear about the deep the deep thinking that you've done. Awesome. Awesome. I would I would love to have you on at a later point uh, because I don't think we've obviously heard the end of like uh, the Dugan, Bolsonaro, Olavo, Bannon, things that are happening in geopolitics. Oh, yeah. Um, but I, I just, you know, a very heartfelt thank you. I, I'm, and I owe you a bit of gratitude for, I mean, it was, uh, in reading this book in, um, uh, in researching the things to, that led to this conversation, it has been enlightening. It's been, <laughs> use the word enlightening. Uh, it has been, uh, you know, it, it's, it's illuminated a lot of different things. It's changed a lot of the ways that I think it's, uh, it's opened my eyes to a few more possibilities and, um, and who knows, maybe I've just leveled up in terms of the amount of, uh, I don't know, fucking neo-Nazi esoteric Hitlerism <laughs> material I can ingest and 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 kind of relate to the world somehow. And I, it's shitty that I have to relate that to the world, but it is ver strikingly relevant uh, in geopolitics yeah. and everything. So, totally, totally. Yeah, man. 
All right, man. Well, I will let you go, and I will send you. I'll send you an email that lets you know when the show is out and stuff like that. But again, I thank you Perfect. and and congratulations on on num- kid number three, brother. You know, I, no, I'm happy to, yeah. <laughs> thank you for being. I really appreciate you taking the time to you know to follow up with me and everything. I I, I hate to act like such a diva, but like no, this, no, you. Had, it's, it's killing. It's killing me. It's right at this moment. It's just taking mm. over. So. Well, thank you again. Thank you so much. And best to you and yours, brother. And I can't wait to talk to you about this stuff again in the future. So, Likewise. Likewise. Right, Take care, Jules. You too. Great man. to chat with you. you too. Bye. Bye-bye.